my my screen is visible dr deepa yes sir screen is visible we just okay. like voice for a few seconds once okay am i audible now <clears throat> yes sir okay so uh, uh, the both both the regime were equivalent or iso effective so naturally if you combine these two and try to find out the potentiating effect of chemo radiotherapy in reference to conventional fractionation then there should be improvement in local control by 10 to 12% i hope you understood if not i just try to explain it further here if you look at the british columbia study the chemo radiotherapy versus accelerated radiotherapy have the similar local tumor control while in danka trial the accelerated radiotherapy versus conventional fractionation radiotherapy there was 10% improvement in local control similarly in iaea trial the accelerated radiotherapy versus conventional radiotherapy there was 12% difference in local control so if by any means this conventional fractionation radiotherapy arm we bring here in british columbia study then as per this trial there will be a difference of 12% between accelerated radiotherapy versus conventional fractionation radiotherapy and since chemo radiotherapy arm have similar effect as accelerated radiotherapy arm so we can say or we can hypothesize that chemo radiotherapy effect will be there will be a difference of 12% as well so just the hypothesis keeping here that if chemo radiotherapy is uh, tested against conventional radiotherapy arm uh, then there should be a 10 to 12% difference this is what is hypothesized or what is predicted from linear quadratic model and naturally now we have to uh, validate this on our, our clinical setting and this uh, issue was validated or tested by one of the very popular and important meta analysis in head and neck cancer that is mckenzie meta analysis which is one of the largest meta analysis involving 93 randomized trial involving almost more than 17000 patient so basically what we are comparing in this meta analysis chemo radiotherapy versus radiotherapy alone and hypothesis say that there should be a 10 to 12% improvement in chemo radiotherapy arm and look at the result of this meta analysis there was a 13% improvement so this meta analysis shows there was a 13% improvement at 5 year which is very very closely in agreement with 12% which we calculated from linear quadratic model so again even with chemo radiotherapy the linear quadratic model is proving itself a very good model in predicting the outcome so with this i can just give you take home that hyperfractionation and accelerated fractionation potentiate the effect of radiation by 10 to 12% similar enhancement of the effect of radiation is also achieved with concurrent chemo radiotherapy in head and neck cancer now other application of this overall treatment type now in head and neck cancer many of you must be treating with in intensity modulated radiotherapy now if you if you if you remember the dose which is delivered to microscopic dose or sorry microscopic disease in head and neck region when you treat with imrt is higher than this dose to the same microscopic disease if you treat with non imrt plan for example in head and neck region head and neck cancer basically we treat these three region microscopic region which is given to be which is given 50 gray high tumor burden microscopic disease which is near to the gross tumor the area of the neck or the lymph node which are nearer to the uh, tumor we uh, microscopic disease and we usually give 60 gray and the gross tumor we deliver 70 gray so just in a diagrammatic fashion uh, the gross tumor we deliver 70 gray the region which are near or lymph node which are near to the gross tumor considered as high tumor burden microscopic disease and we treat with 60 gray and then whole neck we give 50 gray how do we do in non imrt plan by shrinking field technique i think all of us practice shrinking field technique if head and neck cancers are treated with non imrt plan and how do we do first we treat the whole neck and deliver a 50 gray 25 fractions 5 week then we reduce the radiation 
feed and deliver 60 gray 30 fraction in six weeks time and finally the field is gone down to the gross tumor and we deliver one week's time so these three reasons are treated but at different overall treatment time this reason is treated for five weeks this reason is treated for six weeks and this reason is treated for seven weeks so we can say that overall treatment time for different reason is different from five weeks to seven weeks and dose per fraction though remains the same that is two gray per fraction now if you remember your imrt plan if you generate a single plan then you deliver of course 70 gray to the gross tumor with imrt also but for microscopic disease instead of 50 gray you deliver 56 gray and for for high burden microscopic disease instead of 60 gray you deliver 63 gray so question is why this again the function of overall treatment time just try to understand now in a seven weeks plan now if for non imrt plan you give five weeks to this microscopic disease now in a single seven weeks plan you are now treated you are now seven weeks time so overall treatment time increased from five to seven weeks so we need to find out equivalent dose for 50 grain five weeks which can be delivered in seven weeks which will have the same effect as 50 gray in five weeks similarly the reason to the overall treatment time is increased from six weeks to seven weeks so again we need to find out the equivalent dose which can be delivered in seven weeks and of course the third or the gross tumor we always give 70 gray whether with non imrt plan or imrt plan so overall treatment time does not change we know that accelerated repopulation dose is around 0.6 per day and in a week time or five days so in a week you will require three gray extra dose in order to compensate the prolonged overall treatment time so for for gross tumor you are delivering 70 gray in seven weeks two gray per fraction whether imrt or non imrt plan so there is no change in overall treatment time but for uh, region two the overall time increase from six to seven weeks. So you require three gray additional dose so that we deliver 63 gray now in seven weeks for this reason. And this reason one overall treatment time is increased from five weeks to seven weeks. So naturally you require around six gray more dose to counter the accelerated repopulation. And that is why we deliver 56 gray. I hope now you understand why we deliver different doses in IMRT setting. So instead of 50, uh, instead of 50 gray, 56, instead of 60 gray, 63. Now many centers, they generate a six weeks plan for IMRT. Now here the total treatment duration is six weeks. And basically this plan is generated uh, for giving equivalent dose to high tumor burden microscopic disease of non IMRT plan, which means we match the dose of reason two. So reason two, 60 gray in six week, two gray per fraction we deliver. Uh, for reason one, or for, for let us say gross tumor, the overall treatment time has been reduced from seven weeks to six weeks. So naturally you will save around three to four gray for accelerated repopulation, because now the accelerated repopulation will only be up to six week time. So here, instead of 70 gray, you deliver 66 gray in six weeks time. While for region one, you have increased the overall treatment time from five to six weeks. So naturally you will have to add either three to four gray to make it equivalent to 50 gray in five weeks. So you deliver around 54 gray in six weeks time. So when you generate a six week plan, you deliver 66 gray to gross tumor, 54 gray to low burden microscopic disease and 60 gray to high burden tumor microscopic disease. So that finishes my this module. And now let me go directly to my next module where I will discuss more clinical application of linear quadratic model. Now in this module, I will discuss uh, clinical application of hypofractionation, including the uh, uh, 
extreme hypofractionation, what we call SRS and SDRT, plus factors which affect the cell survival curve. Now let us start with hypofractionation. Now in hypofractionation, total number of fraction is less as compared to conventional fractionation. I think all of us are practicing hypofractionation, but most commonly we practice in our palliative setting and most co common regime which we use, use is 30 grain 10 fraction. But recently it has been used as curative treatment in breast and prostate. So what is the radiobiology I will discuss. It has also been used as extreme hypofractionation in SRS and SDRT. Again, what is the radiobiology? I will discuss in my subsequent slide. So first let me discuss about the carcinoma of breast. So what is the radiobiological basis for hypofractionation in carcinoma of breast? The principle is very simple. If you remember in my first module, I said that breast cancer behave like a late reacting tissue. It has got a alpha beta ratio similar to alpha beta ratio of late reacting tissue that is four grade. So if you remember this curve or this graph, which I discussed so many times, that when you increase the dose from D1 to D2, it causes more damage to the tissue having low alpha beta ratio. So naturally, when you give high dose per fraction, it will result into more damages in subclinical diseases in breast. So that is the principle behind using hypofractionated radiotherapy in carcinoma breast. There are three landmark trials which tested the hypofractionated radiotherapy against the conventional fractionation on the basis of which now we practice and it has become a standard of care to use hypofractionated radiotherapy in carcinoma breast. So what are those three? I will discuss one by one. Now, there are two trials from UK and one trial from Canada. Now, this is a UK trial and this is the start B trial. Now, if you see the arms post BCS, the conventional fractionation arm, the, the hypofractionated arm. If you calculate the biological effective dose for conventional fractionation, it was 75. For, for hypofractionation, it was 70. Now, if you just look at the BED, what will be your first impression now? First impression will be that conventional arm should be better than hypofractionated arm uh, because it has, it is delivering more biological effective dose. Look at the result. Now you see 50 gray arm has higher local recurrences as compared to 40 gray arm. While if you look at the BED, you have the uh, immediate, you know, impression it should be other way around. But actually in clinical setting, you are getting more local recurrences in 50 gray arm as compared to 40 gray arm. And let me just tell you that though these difference in local recurrences were not statistically significant, and that is the reason that now we are using hypofractionated radiotherapy. But from radiobiological point of view, I am telling you, uh, you know, I just want to clarify uh, how, how we can explain you know, these higher recurrences in 50 gray arm from radiobiology point of view. So when authors also realize that there are higher recurrences in 50 gray arm in, in spite of the fact that biological effective dose is higher, they retrospectively looked into their data and analyzed radiobiologically their data. And they, you know, presented or they published this data separately uh, very, very, I mean, uh, it was uh, published probably in 2010. Uh, now, in this uh, article, they uh, reached to the conclusion that breast cancer also shows accelerated repopulation or accelerated proliferation after three weeks, uh, beyond three weeks of radiation, similar to head and neck cancer. And deproliferative or dose which goes waste to counter the accelerated repopulation is 0.6 gray per day, similar to head and neck cancer. And now you get the answer. So if you see the overall treatment time in start B trial, it is different. In 40 gray arm, it is 19 days. In 50 gray arm, it is 33 days. So you have to use time factor in order to get effective BED. So there was a difference of 12 days. And after three weeks, you know, you, 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 uh, 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 there is a difference of 12 days. And we know per day, dose uh, which goes waste is 0.6 gray. 
So total do, uh, BED comes out to be 7.2 gray, which will use to offset the effect of repopulation. So if you incorporate this BED now in with this BED, you will get an effective BED. And the effective BED now you can appreciate is less than hyperfractionated R. And that is the reason or that explains that why we get higher local decreases in 50 gray R. Now, similarly, uh, the cosmesis was better in hyperfractionated R. And again, you will, you know, ask me that from the very beginning, I have been telling you that if when you increase the dose per fraction, it causes more damage for late effect. But here in this trial, we are getting better cosmesis in hyperfractionated arm. Again, answer is hidden in radiobiology or in biological effective dose. If you calculate the uh, biological effective dose for late effect in two arms, you will appreciate that biological effective dose was higher in 50 gray arm. And that is the reason that, uh, you know, you have more uh, compromise in cosmesis uh, in 50 gray arm, but less in 40 gray arm. The second, you know, important trial was Canadian trial. It was similar to the start B trial. Again, 50 gray in 25 fraction and 42.5 gray in 16 fraction. Again, if you calculate BED, it is 75, it is 70. So naturally it gives the impression that this arm should be better and should have low local decreases. But again, see the standard arm or the conventional fractionation arm having higher local decreases as compared to hyperfractionated arm. And again, just to remind you that there was five very higher BED on conventional fractionated arm. But now we know the answer because if you see the overall treatment time, it was different in both the arm. So you need to find out the dose of radiation which goes based in conventional fractionation arm and when you incorporate this dose here you get effective BED and now you can see that effective BED is less in conventional fractionation arm and that is the reason that you have higher local decreases in conventional fractionation arm. We start A trial three arms 50 grain 25 fraction and then these two hyperfractionated arm but the important point here is that in all the three arms, the overall treatment time was same, five weeks, five weeks, five weeks. So there was no difference in overall treatment time. And again, if you see the local decreases, it was highest or in, in 39 gray arm and almost similar in 50 gray or 41.6 gray. Again, the same you can explain once you calculate the biological effective dose. You can see that minimum biological effective dose was delivered in 39 gray arm. That is why you had uh, highest local decreases in 39 gray. And in these two arms, the biological effective dose is almost similar. That is why you have similar local decreases in both the arm. So it is very interesting that if you want to look at the result and you want to know why there is a difference, one of the reason, one of the reason could be difference in biological effective dose. So you just calculate the biological effective dose and you may get answer. And this is applicable to any data, any analysis. Now coming on to prostate cancer, again, the reason is same because prostate cancer also behave like late reacting tissue and it has got an alpha beta ratio of 1.5. So we, if we increase the dose per fraction, it will cause more damage to prostate cancer than the surrounding normal tissue. And there are many phase three trials which are ongoing RTOG CHIP. In fact, CHIP trial has been published. So let me just uh, spend a few minutes or few, few seconds on the CHIP trial. Now here the conventional fractionation arm was compared with two hyperfractionated arm, uh, 60 gray and 57 gray. And this was published, uh, you know, almost three, four years back. And if you look at the result, the biochemical uh, uh, failure free survival, uh, you know, uh, the, the curves are very close to each other. And in fact, uh, from this trial, uh, it was concluded that 74 was, uh, you know, uh, similar to 60 gray arm or 60 gray arm is not inferior to 74 gray arm. But if you just radiobiologically, let me, uh, you know, discuss radiobiologically. Now, if you look at the uh, magnified view, you will appreciate that best result was obtained with 60 gray arm, followed by 74 gray arm and least results was seen in this arm, that is 57 gray arm. And again, if you want to know why there is a difference. 
just calculate the bd and you will get the answer the 60 gray arm delivered the highest bd and that is why you have best result the 74 gray arm uh, delivered slightly less bd that is why it is in the middle and 57 gray delivered least bd that is why it has got the worst result so this is very interesting. I think in future also, whenever you analyze any data, just calculate the BD and many times you will get the answer. Now, in last two uh, you know, sites, that is prostate and breast, we saw that hypofractionated arm is not inferior or is non-inferior to conventional fractionation. But there is one site in the body where we have seen that hypofractionated radiotherapy is better than conventional fractionated radiotherapy. And yesterday, somebody raised this question also. So if you remember, which is the site where hyperfractionated radiotherapy is better than conventional fractionation, then immediately, if you remember, it will come to your mind, the Yamazaki trial in T1 larynx cancer, or T1 glottic cancer. Now this basically is a trial comparing uh, conventional fractionation with hyperfractionation in T1 glottic cancer. Now, if you just uh, see minutely these two arms, there were two changes made in the experimental arm. One dose per fraction was increased from two gray to 2.25 gray. Second, overall treatment time was reduced. So keep these two point, these are very important point, keep these two point in your mind. Now, if you just calculate the BD between the two arms for late effect, as well as for tumor. Now, surprisingly, there was no difference. I mean, both BD was matched. So from this, what you know, impression we have? The impression which we have from just looking at biological effective dose for the tumor, the immediate you know, thing comes to my mind that both the arm are ISO effective or they should have equal local tumor control. But if you look at the outcome, you will be surprised that hypofractionated arm was having better local tumor control as compared to conventional fractionation, which was statistically significant, though the biological effective dose was equivalent in both the arm. Now, reason actually we do not know. I mean, authors uh, did not explain what is the reason. But I just, you know, thought a lot about the reason, possible reason, and I could reach to some you know, point which, uh, which may probably be the reason why we get a better outcome in hypofractionated arm. And these you know, points I will just discuss with you in the next slide. So I told you that there were two changes in the experimental arm, just try to understand. One, overall treatment time was reduced. And when you reduce the overall treatment time, it countered the repopulation. Right. And from the Danker trial, we know that repopulation is mainly seen in well differentiated tumor and moderately differentiated cancer. And we are, if you if you if you recall the glottic cancer, especially T1 glottic cancer, majority of them are well differentiated and few are moderately differentiated, very less are poorly differentiated. So here we get an advantage that when you reduce the overall treatment time, probably the, it reduces the effect of repopulation in glottic cancer. So that is one you know, uh, explanation which can be given here. The other uh, explanation is related with law of Bergoni and Tribundu. Now, according to this law, the radio sensitivity of a population of cell is inversely proportional to their degree of differentiation. And as most of the glottic T1 cancers are well differentiated cancer, so naturally they are least sensitive, right? And the another change which we made here in experimental arm was increasing the dose per fraction. So when you increase the dose per fraction, naturally it is more tumoricidal. So you get another advantage here for killing the well differentiated cell in experimental arm. So probably these two reasons may be there because of which we get better outcome in hypofractionated arm. This is what I could think. I don't know whether they are, whether, you know, they are right or not, but that is a logic which I could think and I am sharing with you. Anyway, 
Now coming on to the radiobiology of extreme hyperfractionation, that is SRS and SBRT. I am pretty sure that majority of most of the centers are now treating some malignant disease or benign disease with SRS and SBRT. So what is the radiobiology of SRS and SBRT? We know that SRS and SBRT basically you give very high dose of radiation either in a single fraction or maybe two to five fraction and it is used for benign and malignant disease both. Now since here we are using single fraction right or maybe very few fraction. So I always love to call this type of delivery as non-fractionated radiotherapy. So from here onward, I will just you know, discuss about the, or I will speak non-fractionated radiotherapy rather than SRS and SBRT. And when I will speak fractionated radiotherapy, it means conventional fractionated radiotherapy. Now, to get the best outcome by non-fractionated radiotherapy, these are the criteria we should be met. What are those criteria? The target should be small. And in fact, ideally it is recommended for less than three centimeter tumor. There should be highest degree of conformality. So what does it mean? It means that suppose you have a spherical tumor, then your high dose cloud should tightly pack around this tumor. Third, there should be steep dose gradient. So what does it mean? It means that if you have a spherical tumor, and if you, uh, you know, prescribe dose at periphery, say 50% isodose line, then outside this 50% isodose line, the dose falls very rapidly so that within millimeter, it becomes insignificant. When it falls outside rapidly, the opposite happens inside. It rises rapidly from 50% to 100% inside the tumor, giving rise to inhomogeneous dose distribution. Now, here the catch, the catch is that in fractionated radiotherapy, we always try to get a homogeneous dose distribution across the target. In non-fractionated radiotherapy, we always deliberately try to achieve a non-homogeneous dose distribution so that you get, you know, sharp dose gradient or steep dose gradient. So same thing I'm emphasizing here again, that outside the target, there is a sharp dose gradient. Outside the target, within two millimeter, dose falls less than half. Inside the target, within two millimeter, dose rises more than double. So it results into sharp gradient. Now, what is the rationale or what is the radiobiological principle behind using non-fractionated radiotherapy? First, I will try to explain with cell survival curve, right? So just you know, concentrate on your screen. Now, this is the uh, typical shape of cell survival curve. Low dose reason, I have divided into two reasons. One is low dose reason, one is high dose reason. Now, just concentrate on low dose reason. Suppose you deliver one gray, it reduces survival fraction to some extent. An increment of two gray from one gray to three gray will further reduce survival fraction. Now concentrate on high dose reason. You deliver 15 gray, it reduces survival fraction to this point. An increment of two gray from 15 to 70 gray with further reduces survival fraction. But the important observation which you can see here that similar increment of two gray in high dose reason reduces survival fraction much more as compared to low dose reason. So the first principle is that high dose per fraction is more tumoricidal and is more damaging. Second, now as I said that we are treating benign tumor also with the non-fractionated radiotherapy. We know benign tumor behaves like a late reacting tissue. They have low alpha beta ratio like AVM, meningioma, acoustic neuroma, etc. While malignant tumor behaves like an early reacting tissue and they have high alpha beta ratio similar to early reacting tissue. So the upper panel belongs to benign tumor, the lower panel belongs to malignant tumor. And this graph we have discussed many times in reference to late and early reacting tissue. But this time I am discussing in reference to benign tumor versus malignant tumor. So same thing, you give D1 dose, reduces survival fraction, increase the dose per fraction, further reduces survival fraction, but reduction in survival fraction for benign tumor is much more as compared to malignant tumor. So the second 
uh, you know, principle is that high dose per fraction is more damaging to benign lesion with low alpha beta ratio like meningioma, UVM, acoustic neuroma, etc. But at this point, you can say that same principle will apply to late reacting tissue. When you will increase the dose per fraction, it will cause more damage for late effect in the tissue which surrounds the tumor. Answer is yes, it should. Then the question is that how we overcome this problem? Now this problem is overcome by highly precise, highly conformal radiotherapy with minimum surrounding normal tissue in high dose clouds. And this gives rise to the concept of red shell. So what is red shell we need to understand. So red shell is basically the volume of the, uh, the volume of the normal tissue, which receive very high dose of radiation, almost similar to the target, or maybe just, uh, you know, less than target, but it is very high. So let me explain the red shell. Now, uh, we define the tumor with the gross tumor volume, then microscopic disease with clinically target volume, and then for various uncertainty, PTV or planning target volume. Now you tell me that PTV, does PTV contain any malignant cell? Answer is no. PTV only contains normal tissue, right? But only, only thing is that we need to do PTV for various uncertainties. But we always prescribe dose at PTV, which means that normal tissue inside the PTV will receive very high dose of radiation. And this will form one portion of the red cell, what we call inner red shell, right? Now, outside this PTV, dose will fall very rapidly. But during this fall, is still some thickness of the tissue around the PTV will receive high dose of radiation, which is not safe. This is called outer red shell. By planning, we deliberately created a deep here because we don't want high dose cloud to fall on the critical structure, which are serial critical structure. And just to complete the diagram, when we create deep at one end, naturally a bulge is created on the other end. Now, if you understand the red shell, then in next slide, we will discuss how this red shell affects the two types of radiation delivery, that is fractionated radiotherapy and non-fractionated radiotherapy. So let me just first take an example of fractionated radiotherapy, right? So here I have taken the typical head and neck cancer uh, schedule, 70 gray, 35 fraction, two gray per fraction. Now for surrounding normal tissue, we generalize a safe biological effective dose for late effect, 100 gray. So this is safe for late effect for the surrounding normal tissue. And this will be achieved in 60 gray in 30 fraction, right? This is the cross section of our isodose distribution. So just concentrate here. So in the center, we have GTV, then we have CTV, then we have PTV. And you can appreciate that across the PTV in fractionated radiotherapy, the isodose distribution or the dose is homogeneous. Outside the PTV, we have surrounding normal tissue. Now this is the point of tolerance dose, which is a safe BUD, that is 60 gray, right? So naturally all the tissue which are beyond this point will receive a safe dose, that is less than 60 gray, which is a safe BUD. But this intervening tissue will be receiving more than 60 gray and it will form the red shell. Now this red shell will receive more than 60 gray, but less than 70 gray. Now suppose on an average, the tissue here in this red shell receives 64 gray, but it will be delivered in 35 fraction because we plan 35 fraction. So dose per fraction will be 1.8 gray. We can calculate BED. I think all of you now can calculate BED. Putting these value here, the BED comes out to be 102 gray, right, for late effect. Now, 102 gray, you will appreciate, is not much or is not different than 100 gray, which is a safe BED. So we can say that in fractionated radiotherapy, there will be red shell, but it will not cause late damages in the surrounding normal tissue because biological effective dose is almost similar to safe BED. 
what happens in non fractionated radio therapy now here i have taken an example of 12 gray four times for surrounding normal tissue safe bd will remain safe that is 100 gray three but this time it will be achieved in 29 gray in four fraction this is the uh, isodose distribution the cross section again see in center we have gtv then ctv then ptv and you can appreciate that across the ptv there is a sharp dose gradient as is the characteristic feature of non fractionated radiotherapy then we have surrounding normal tissue now this is the point of tolerance dose to the surrounding normal tissue so all the normal tissue which is beyond this point will receive less than 100 gray 3 bd which is a safe bd but naturally this intervening tissue will form red shell and this tissue will receive more than 29 gray but less than 48 gray let us presume that this intervening tissue receive on an average 36 gray so naturally 9 gray four times and now again we can calculate bd from this formula and if we calculate it comes out to be 144 gray which is much much higher as compared to safe bd of 100 gray which means that in non fractionated radiotherapy the red shell effect is significant but not in fractionated radiotherapy so when we understood the red shell effect how significant it is in non fractionated radiotherapy then our effort should be to reduce the thickness or volume of this red shell as minimum as possible and the question is how we can do that there are various ways by which we can do that one is keeping the dose gradient very steep it is usually done by our medical physicists who use multiple non coplanar beam and do a careful planning keeping the target volume minimum that is why non fractionated radiotherapy ideally is suitable for uh, you know early lesions only early disease less than 3 cm is the ideal you know lesion reducing the pt margin now the question is how we can reduce the pt margin we can reduce the pt margin by using modern radiotherapy techniques like igrt 4d radiotherapy or gamma knife so when we use modern radiotherapy technique we reduce the uncertainty and among all in my personal opinion gamma knife is best because we know that uh, you know brain inside the um, uh, skull does not move or move very little and skull when is fixed stereotactically it also does not move and when whole assembly is fixed inside the gamma camera Uh, nothing moves the table does not move even the radiation source does not move so minimum movement you have minimum uncertainty so in my opinion gamma knife is best to reduce the pt margin <clears throat> and finally delivering total dose in more than one fraction and usually 2 to 4 fraction is recommended if possible okay so uh, now the next question is that is there any other radio biological process which get triggered at such a high dose in non fractionated radiotherapy which is usually not seen in conventional fractionation it is proposed that two more process of the cell kill also get activated in non fractionated radiotherapy these are vascular damage and stem cell death and i will discuss one by one so these two process also contribute in cell kill in non fractionated radiotherapy apart from alpha and beta cell kill so in nutshell i will say that in fractionated radiotherapy you only have two process of cell kill that is alpha and beta in non fractionated radiotherapy you have four process of cell kill alpha beta stromal damage or vascular damage and fourth stem cell death so i will discuss these two again in detail one by one <clears throat> now vascular damage we know tumor vasculature is aberrated abnormal vessels are dilated tortuous elongated with avian blind end basement membrane is thin they are leaky and if you look at the cell survival curve of normal tissue endothelial cell and tumor endothelial cell it is much steeper and we know if it is much steeper it is more sensitive to radiation than normal tissue endothelial cell there are plenty of preclinical evidence which suggests that when you deliver high dose of radiation there is reduction in vascular density 
there are plenty of evidence preclinical evidence which suggests that when you give high dose of radiation the apoptotic cell starts appearing in endothelial lining of the vessels which you don't see at lower dose or in control <clears throat> This is a recent publication which suggests that when you deliver higher dose of radiation, it causes reduction in end vessel density, which is start at six hours and will continue up to 72 hours. Same article also, uh, you know, estimated the percentage of apoptotic cell and they concluded that when you give high dose, the apoptotic cell percentage increases and it starts after six hours and this increase will continue up to 72 hours. Now, this is a very, this is again a very interesting experiment. Just, uh, you know, try to understand. Uh, now here, the uh, two group of uh, mice were taken and one group of mice were genetically altered in such a way that apoptosis is blocked. So we have two group of mice one group have is apoptosis incompetent the other group is normal where apoptosis can take place <clears throat> these two tumors are implanted now they are allowed to grow and at this point we delivered very high dose of radiation and what we observe that in apoptosis competent mouse the the volume decreases but in apoptosis incompetent mouse the volume of the tumor continue to increase. Now these authors also estimated the percentage of apoptotic cell based on the dose of radiation and what they observed that up to certain dose there was no apoptotic cell. But after this point there was linear increase in percentage of apoptotic cell with increasing dose of radiation. So this experiment says that there is a threshold for this process of cell kill to get triggered, which means that this process will not start at lower dose, but after certain dose only, then this process will be activated. <clears throat> there are plenty of preclinical evidence, but what is the clinical evidence that third process of cell kill also contribute in overall cell kill? Again, very interesting, just focus on your screen and try to understand. Now, <clears throat> this is the, uh, you know, linear quadratic model cell survival curve. Now, this is a clinical trial for brain metastatic disease. And these brain lesions were treated with stereotactic radiosurgery. Now, authors calculated the equivalent dose from linear quadratic model means equivalent dose which can be delivered in a single fraction and which will result into excellent tumor control similar to conventional fractionated radiotherapy. So from linear quadratic model, the authors calculated uh, iso effective dose which can be delivered in a single fraction. And it was, you know, it came out to be 25 to 35. Now, if you just concentrate on this cell survival curve, it means that 25 gray will reduce survival fraction to this point, which ultimately will translate into a tumor control probability, say 80%. So this is what authors calculated and, you know, hypothesized from linear quadratic model. Now, when actually they treat the brain lesion with stereotactic radiotherapy or stereotactic radiosurgery, they observed that similar control is obtained at much less doses, around 15 to 20 gray. So what does it mean? It means, <clears throat> again, if you concentrate on the uh, cell survival curve, it means that 20, in fact, this point so that you have similar excellent tumor control which means that cell survival curve should pass through this point. And to make the cell survival curve to pass through this point, it has to be much steeper. And it only gets steep when, apart from alpha, also contribute. And I have shown you plenty of example, preclinical 
example deepa my screen is showing internet connection is yeah your voice is breaking uh, screen is visible <clears throat> it is looks breaking. fine now it, it is breaking fine. frequently or you know maybe, uh, maybe no some... not much it's fine now okay, okay. so <clears throat> so it has it it will be steeper only when third process of the cell kill will also contribute in overall cell kill apart from alpha and beta and we have plenty of evidence which suggests that third process of the cell kill is also you know get activated when you deliver very high dose of radiation so <clears throat> now if you look at the cell survival curve you know uh, uh, and take into account the third third process of cell kill also apart from alpha and beta now this is the cell survival curve as per alpha beta cell kill obtained from linear quadratic model again to make uh, my so, point so yes. can i interrupt can you just repeat the previous slide like that was not very clear <clears throat> okay so so this was a clinical trial <clears throat> done uh, on brain metastasis Uh, these lesions were treated with SRS. So authors calculated the uh, iso-effective single fraction dose from linear quadratic model, which will have the excellent tumor control, say 80% of tumor control probability. Now, <clears throat> the LQ model, uh, you know, suggests around 25 to 35 grams, right? So if you just concentrate on this cell survival curve. 25 gray should reduce survival fraction to this point so that it should translate into a tumor control probability of 80%. So this is just hypothetical calculated based on linear quadratic model, right? But so so author is you know uh, started treating with 25 gray, but they observed that similar tumor control probability was observed with much less dose than calculated one. so it was found that even 20 gray will result into 80% tumor control probability which means if you just now come back to the cell survival curve it means that at 20 gray the survival fraction should reduce to this point which will translate into a tumor control probability of 80% but cell survival curve is passing through this point so naturally if 20 gray is giving the same tumor control probability the cell survival curve should pass through this point and to make it pass through this point it has to be steeper and steepness means that the cells are most more sensitive and means that more cells are being killed so how can you know more cells be killed if we, we take only into account alpha and beta cell kill so we know that at very high dose the third process of cell kill also start contributing in overall cell kill and that process is endothelial damage or vascular damage i hope now it should be clear so it will be more clear here again so if you now uh, look at the cell survival curve this is a cell survival curve from linear quadratic model and it represent only two process of cell kill that is alpha and beta now to make my point further clear i will concentrate on 15 gray i dose so 15 gray dose will reduce survival fraction to this point which will translate into a tumor control probability of 50% now when you give single fraction or high dose of fraction we are we now are convinced that third process of cell kill that is vascular damage also contribute in overall cell kill so there will be reduction in survival fraction because of this vascular damage or because of cell kill due to vascular damage but we have seen that there is a threshold for this cell kill to get activated and this is usually at you know up to this point say 10 gray or 12 gray right <clears throat> only after this when when you give higher than this dose then it will kill the cell because of vascular damage and this will result into reduction in survival fraction because of vascular damage so this is the third process now if you incorporate this third process into this linear quadratic model how it will 
now seen how this cell survival curve will be seen or what will be the shape of this cell survival curve so when you join this curve or incorporate this curve to this curve now naturally up to this point now you see up to this point there is no reduction in survival fraction or there is no you know dip in the cell survival curve so up to this point there will not be any difference it will be same but after this point now the cell kill because of this process of cell kill contribute so naturally the curve becomes much steeper right i hope now it is understood the curve becomes much steeper after this point right and which means that 15 gray now if you take the third process of cell kill into account then 15 gray will reduce the survival fraction to this point which will result into much higher tumor control probability as compared to tumor control probability which is calculated from just linear quadratic model and this is what we saw in our previous slide on a clinical setting i'm pretty sure that now it should be very clear so in extreme hypofractionation we have endothelial apoptosis resulting into vascular damage hampering blood supply and ultimately leading to cell death so this is the third process of cell kill what are other two process of cell kill alpha and beta so now so far we have seen that there are three process of cell kill which are contributing then fourth process of cell kill is stem cell death <clears throat> we know that most of the tumor uh, you know have stem cells which are relatively radio resistant like cd133 positive glial cell glamour cell or cd45 positive breast cell now what are the evidence we suggest that there is a direct damaging effect of high dose of radiation on these stem cells so this is one of the experiment a very interesting experiment again try to understand now here the jejunum villi of mice was irradiated with increasing dose of radiation if just to again refresh your physiology of villi we have stem cell at the base then progenitor cell and then functional cell or differentiated cell and these cell move to villi perform its function and die all right so these cell will move to villi perform its function and die now authors were uh, you know irradiating the jejuna villi with increasing dose of radiation and what they were trying to achieve they were trying to achieve death of stem cell and how do we know that death of stem cells takes place by clinical manifestation of irreversible diarrhea if only progenitor cells are killed and stem cells survive then it will result into reversible diarrhea which will be healed or or the mice will recover after some time or some days but if they if 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 it leads to irreversible diarrhea it means that stem cells are also killed so this is what authors were trying to achieve and look at the result so initially when they irradiated with radiation you know only progenitor cells were killed and there was no irreversible diarrhea in any mice leading to death of the mice it resulted into reversible diarrhea but it was healed now after this dose when they further increase the dose of radiation now this time the stem cells might have been damaged because it resulted into irreversible diarrhea leading to death of mice but this damage to stem cell may be attributed to the third process of cell kill that is endothelial apoptosis resulting into stem cell death so we cannot say at this point that there is a direct damaging effect on stem cell next what authors did they altered genetically these mice so that endothelial apoptosis is blocked and when they further irradiate these mice they observe that there is no death or no irreversible diarrhea up to this dose but after this dose they it it resulted into irreversible diarrhea leading to death of mice and now we can say that in absence of apoptosis there is a direct damaging effect of radiation to stem cells in fact they identified stem cell population in the crib which die at a very high dose 
So I hope all of you now convinced that uh, we have four processes of cell kill in non-fractionated radiotherapy. One is linear, other is quadratic, the third is vascular, and the fourth is stem cell death. Okay, so let me now go on for more application of linear quadratic model. This is just to show you effect of inhomogeneity inside the target. Though we say that there is a homogeneous dose distribution, but usually we take plus minus 5% as a homogeneous dose distribution and we accept the plan. So we define the target as ZTV and then CTV and then PTV and we you know, say dose homogeneity if there is a plus minus 5% uh, variation across the PTV. But so if you are, you know, if you prescribe 60 gray in 30 fractions, six weeks time, then, and, and, and there is a 5% plus minus inhomogeneity, then you, if, you, if you see, then some point or some cells in this target will receive 57 gray, while some target will receive 63 gray. So this is an inhomogeneity, but we consider it as homogeneity and we accept the plan. So what is the impact? of this slight inhomogeneity. Now, all points or all cells receiving 57 gray in 30 fraction, dose per fraction will be 1.9 gray per fraction, which is less damaging than two gray. All cells receiving 63 gray in 30 fraction with 2.1 gray per fraction will be, it will be more damaging than two gray, right? So, there are two variables. One is variation in physical dose, 57 and 63. And second, variation in radiobiological dose. So you have to consider both the variation and this is called double trouble. This is more important in reference to normal tissue toxicity. Now here, the spinal cord, uh, you know, is planned for 25 fraction of two gray each. So total 50 gray. And if you see, there is a hot spot here, which is 110%. So if you just calculate physical dose, it is 55 gray. But remember that 55 gray is to be delivered in 25 fraction. So now dose per fraction increased. And when you increase the dose per fraction, it causes more damage to the spinal cord. So if you calculate the biological effective dose, now it is 60.5. So you not only consider the physical dose, but also consider the the, the biological effective dose. Now limitation of LK model is that it is not accurate at the two extremes. I will just show what happens at very low dose, right? This is just a, you know, you know <clears throat> some concept in radiobiology. Uh, I don't know uh, if there is any clinical implication of this concept, but I will discuss for the students. Now, there are two terms, you know, what happens at a very low dose? You see, whatever cell survival curve we studied so far, basically those curves were generated uh, for a dose of one gray or more than one gray. But what happens when you generate a cell survival curve for doses which is less than one gray? So here, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So it has been observed that at a very low dose, there is a sharp, you know, a sharp uh, decrease in survival fraction or the curve is very steep up to 0.3 or 0.4 gray. After that, there is a very shallow curve up to one gray. And after that, you know, the, the typical shape of the cell survival curve, which we have studied so far. So you can see that if it is the steepest part, portion of the curve, which means that here the cell should be more sensitive or the reduction in survival fraction should be maximum. As you can compare similar increment here, result into this much of reduction in survival fraction, while here, this much of reduction in survival fraction. So maximum reduction in survival fraction, and that is why we call it hyper radio sensitivity. In this reason, the minimum reduction in survival fraction, if you see just this one, similar increment. So this is called increased radio resistance. So these are the two phenomena. What is the mechanism of action? Again, for, for examination purpose or for theory purpose. Now, when you deliver radiation, low dose of radiation, say 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3 gray, the, there is a damage in the DNA. So all the cells which are present in G2 phase, they have DNA damage. They will pass on to the next phase of cell cycle, but there is a checkpoint here. 
right? Where repair of this DNA damage will take place. But at such a low dose, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, this repair mechanism is not activated. Body is not able to activate this checkpoint, right? But at the same time, body fully realize that this is a damaged cell. If it goes to the next phase of cell cycle, it will not be good for the body. But at the same time, body also realize its limitation that it is not able to activate the checkpoint. So what body decide, body decide that it is better that let this cell die and body push this cell through another process of cell death that is apoptosis. So that is why you get hyper radiation sensitivity. What happens after 0.3 or 0.4 gray? Now, same thing. So all the cells having DNA damage in G2 phase, but now this checkpoint is activated where this repair will takes place. And once it is repaired, only the cells will allow to move into the next phase of cell cycle. So you have increasing radio resistance. Now what is the clinical you know, application? I mean, theoretically, practically, it, it, it is not possible, but theoretically, what can be the clinical application? If you put a block at the end of G2, then all the cell will be accumulated here. And this can be done by treating cells with various chemotherapeutic agents like vinca alkaloid, etoposide, and taxin. Now, when all the cells are accumulated here, then treat them with low dose of radiation so that with hyper radiation sensitivity, you can achieve maximum tumor cell kill, right? So it is just theoretical, not possible, but certainly there may be some clinical application or clinical, clinical implication in IMRT plan, right? Now in IMRT, we know that large area of normal tissue is irradiated to low dose of radiation. Now this is an IMRT plan of pelvis. Now you see the peripheral tissue receive very low dose of radiation, 10 gray. And suppose you plan 25 fraction. So 10 gray to be delivered in 25 fraction will be 0 0.4 gray per fraction. And this is the reason where you get maximum hyper radiation sensitivity. So there will be lot of late side effect. And one of the important organ here is femur. So you may get Higher, higher fracture neck femur. But let me tell you, or all of you are aware that now IMRT we have been using for almost more than three decades, but we have never seen in our clinical practice higher fracture neck femur. So theoretically or radiobiologically it looks, but actually we did not get. An explanation was given for this reason why, why we did not get higher fracture neck femur. This may be due to the fact that very little number of cells are present in G2 phase and in late reacting tissue. So very few numbers of cells are present in G2 phase, especially in late reacting tissue. And again, late reacting tissue are not multiplying tissue. So probably we don't get higher fracture neck femur. So to summarize the LQ model, now I am coming to the end of the LQ model. I think I have discussed very, very extensively LQ model, the, the concept of LQ model, its clinical application in all the possible clinical scenario. I'm pretty sure now that all of you must have very, very clear understanding of linear quadratic model, and you will be able to use this linear quadratic model in your day-to-day -day practice. Now, this model explained two types of body tissue early and late behave differently with radiation. This model can be used in clinical practice. This model takes repopulation into account and thus time factor is incorporated. <clears throat> okay, so the next topic in radiobiology, these are the factors which affects the cell survival curve. So there are various factors, long list of factors which affects cell survival curve and they also have clinical implication. So I will discuss one by one. So let me first discuss fractionation, how fractionation affects the cell survival curve. Now this is a very popular picture, you know, all of you must have seen. Now, immediately after discovery of X-ray radiation was delivered as a single large dose, but in 1920, Claude Record, uh, you know, did this experiment. He used ramp testicles and 
you know, irradiated the RAM testicle with single dose and other RAM testicle with fractionated radiotherapy. And he observed that sterilization could be achieved in both the RAM testicle, but less skin reaction in RAM who was treated with fractionated radiotherapy. And this led to the concept of fractionation in radiotherapy. Soon this concept was tested clinically by Handy Courtyard who used fractionated radiotherapy for treatment of head and neck cancer and got excellent outcome. Now, what happens in fractionation? We know there are two types of damage, the lethal damage and sublethal damage. Lethal damage will always result into cell death. Sublethal damage either will result to cell death or will be repaired if there is a sufficient gap between the two radiation events. And this repair is known as Elkins recovery or repair of the sublethal damage. Why we call it Elkins recovery? Because Elkin and Sutton, uh, these two gentlemen, gentlemen showed for the first time that when two exposures were given two hours apart, the shoulder reappeared on cell survival curve. So what happens when you give two fractions few hours apart? Now, this is the cell survival curve when you deliver single fraction. When you deliver two fraction, then shoulder will reappear. And they explained this phenomena by the fact that N minus one targets are hit in some of the cells, resulting into sublethal damage. And this damage is repaired between the two fraction of radiotherapy. So by the time you deliver the second fraction, these damages are repaired and these cells will behave like a fresh cell without any radiation injury. Now this is something like this. I gave you analogy of you know, antisocial element. The 100 people fired 100 bullet. So what will happen? That some of the persons will have or will be hit by bullet, but they will not be killed because it has not hit any sensitive organ. So they will be injured, right? But they will not be, you know, dead. So if you take these persons to hospital and give, uh, you know, treatment, then these people can be recovered from the bullet injury. And they can again join the group of antisocial people and again can be involved in antisocial activity. Same thing is happening here, that there is a hit, but sublethal damage, it was repaired and again they behave like a fresh cells. Now let me explain this experiment, very simple experiment. You take three petri dish, put 100 cells in each petri dish. The first dish is treated with 200 centigrade. Second dish, two fraction of 100 centigrade, but total dose same, 200 centigrade. Third petri dish, three fraction, but total dose same, 200 centigrade. Right. So in this experiment, the total dose is same. The time interval between the fraction is same. Number of fraction is different. Single fraction, two fraction, and three fraction. Incubate for one to two weeks. After two weeks, when you count the colonies, you will appreciate that colonies counted increases as number of fraction increases. Why it is so? Though the total dose is same in all the three petri dishes, 200 centigrade. Now this clearly reflects that there is repair of sublethal damage. Had it not been there, then whether you give in two fraction, three fraction or four, four fraction, but because the overall treatment dose is same, it should have resulted into same colonies counted, but it does not happen. So this clearly indicate that there is repair of sublethal damage between the fractions and how it appears on cell survival curve. Now, if you give single fraction, the curve is, is steepest. When you give second fraction, third fraction, fourth fraction, there are two changes which you are observing. One, every time you add a fraction, the shoulder reappear. Second, every time you add a fraction, the cell survival curves get shallower. And shallowness reflect what, if you remember? that less sensitive, which means that when you give fractionated radiotherapy, the cell becomes less sensitive
to radiation. So, in, to reduce the survival fraction to same level, you will have to deliver increasing dose of radiation to get the same survival fraction. So, we can say that total dose to get the same clinical endpoint is directly proportional to the number of. We can also say that in fractionated radiotherapy, the efficiency to kill the cell decreases. I hope you convince and you agree with this statement after this graph. Now, this is basically due to repair of sublethal damage. And remember that this repair is seen in both the tissue, normal as well as tumor cell. The repair capacity, repair of DNA damage by radiation is different in different cells. Repair capacity, in fact, also influences the radiation sensitivity. And, you know, naturally one can just, you know, correlate with this. If you have less repair, cap you know, capability, then naturally the effect of radiation will be higher. If you have more repair capability, then the radiation effect will be less. Now, <clears throat> these are the cell survival curve of various cell lines. And the steepest curve you can see is the curve for human ataxia telangiectasia cells, which means that human ataxia telangiectasia cell is most sensitive. And why it is more sensitive? Because we know that they lack the DNA repair pathway, which repair the DNA damage by radiation. That is why they are most sensitive. Similarly, the hematopoietic cells, including leukemias and lymphomas, they have poor repair capacity, and that is why they are also very sensitive. Now, clinical <coughs> implication. Now we know breast cancer nowadays is classified based on molecular marker. And broadly we divide into four categories, the luminal A, luminal B, HER positive, basal type or triple negative. And the DNA repair, or they have DNA repair defect. We also know that this is very notorious and it has got highest local recurrences after surgery. Now, if you remember the Canadian hypofractionated study on breast cancer, which I discussed, uh, you know, initially during this module. So these basically Canadian trial, these authors, they retrospectively analyzed their data of breast cancer uh, radiotherapy patient. And they tried to find out the impact of various molecular subtype on local recurrences. And they published it in a separate article in 2014. So what they observed, very interesting. Now we know that local differences are highest for triple negative tumor, right? Because they are very aggressive, okay? But in Canadian trial, what they observed that after post-operative radiotherapy, the least local differences are seen in patient with triple negative breast cancer. So what does it suggest? It suggests that among all the four molecular type, there was response to all four molecular subtype by post-operative radiation, but maximum benefit was observed for triple negative. So what does it suggest? It suggests that triple negative breast cancer cells are most sensitive cells among all four subtype. And this was attributed to the fact that they have DNA repair defect, which make them most sensitive to radiotherapy. And that is the reason that after post-operative radiotherapy, there is maximum elevation in uh, cell survival, sorry, in, in, in local recurrence curve, uh, you know, for triple negative breast cancer. So in, this is the curve for single fraction radiotherapy. When you will fractionated radiotherapy, the curves get shallower. Shallowness reflect less sensitivity, we all know now. And this is, we can say that radiation is less sensitive when we deliver it in fractionation. So radiation is less sensitive when we deliver it in fractionation and this is because of repair of sublethal damage. Now let me just give, uh, you know, let me just explain this experiment. This is a different experiment than the previous one. We take three petri dish, 
put 100 cell in each petri dish now we treat two fraction of 200 centigrade each petri dish but only difference in these you know petri dish is that first petri dish is treated with a time interval of 1 hour gap here is 2 hour gap here is 3 hours so here the total dose is same number of fraction is same only different the only different uh, you know maneuver is the time interval between the two fraction is increasing from 1 hour to 2 hour to 3 hour incubate for 1 to 2 weeks when you count the colonies again you will find that colonies counted keeps increasing now this suggest that there is a fixed time for complete repair for one hour probably complete repair did not take place in all the cells for two hours even repair was not completed some cells is still left where some little damage repair did not take place third hour you know still there may be some cells where complete repair has not taken place right so how does it look on the cell survival curve now this is the cell survival curve for single fraction for two fraction if delivered at one hour interval naturally at this point repair of the sublethal damage has not completed so still there is a scope for more repair so if you give two hours interval naturally the curves get much shallower still there is a scope so if you deliver three hours interval curve still gets more shallow so again to reduce the survival fraction to the same point you have to deliver higher dose of radiation depending upon time interval between the two fraction so we can say that complete repair of sublethal damage takes some time now the question is that how much time the repair is completed now if you look at this graph this shows the relationship between survival fraction and time interval between two fraction so what this curve suggests that initially there is continuous elevation of survival fraction which means that more and more cells are repaired after this time say 5 hours it gets plateau which means that here the repair of the uh, sublethal damage is completed in 5 hours time right so we can say that repair is a dynamic process and follow a specific kinetic the repair of dna damage is an exponential function of time the important point here is that two types of body tissue have different speed of repair it has been observed that early reacting tissue the half 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 life of repair is 0.5 to 1 hour so we can say repair is fast and total recovery is in 4 to 8 hours similarly it will also be applicable to tumor right because tumor behave like early reacting tissue here late reacting tissue the repair half life is 1.5 hours or we can say that repair is slow and total recovery time is more than 12 hours and now you will correlate while why why in urtc trial in hyperfractionated arm we did not get any difference in subcutaneous fibrosis if you remember my previous model previous module because we deliver two fractions at 6 hour interval while we know now that for complete repair of the sublethal damage in late reacting tissue we need 12 hours or more than 12 hours and that was the reason that we did not get any difference in subcutaneous fibrosis similarly in chart trial if you remember chart trial the the long term data suggests that there were there was you know more grade 2 myelopathy or grade 3 myelopathy in patient treated with chart so looking at this data the authors uh, you know uh, analyzed their data radiobiologically and they concluded that for spinal cord the half life of repair is 3.8 hours which means that it is very very slow and total repair takes 24 hours now this is very important as a clinician or as a radiation oncologist to remember that for complete repair from sublethal damage spinal cord takes 24 hours so if you just 
look at the cell survival curve of spinal cord and you deliver two fraction less than 24 hours then it will be something like this but remember that because the two fractions are delivered less than 24 hours which means that repair of sublethal damage has not been completed still there is a scope for repair so if you deliver more than 24 hours then now full recovery has taken place and curves get shallower which means it has got a very important message so it means that to reduce the survival fraction to the same point in spinal cord the dose which will be required will depend that what is the time interval between two fraction similarly the tolerance of the spinal cord will depend the time interval between the two fraction of radiation and it has been observed that when you reduce the uh, time interval between two fraction in spinal cord from 24 hours to 6 to 8 hours you need a 10 to 15 percent reduction in spinal cord tolerance dose which means that if you are if you are giving single fractions per day and tolerance dose is 45 but if you are treating with hyperfractionated radiotherapy the tolerance dose will be 10 to 15 percent less it will be something like 40 gray so remember very important message that if you plan hyperfractionated radiotherapy kindly put a constraint of 40 gray to spinal cord not 45 gray if you put a constraint of 45 gray then you will end up having a lot of late side effect i hope the message is very clear so repair of sublethal damage will depend upon two factors the repair capacity and repair kinetic repair capacity if you remember out of two uh, category of normal tissue which have higher repair capacity it is the late reacting tissue repair kinetic early reacting tissue fast repair late reacting tissue slow repair now what is the clinical application of fractionation now this fractionation clinical application is that it result into therapeutic gain how so now we have let let me discuss let me explain now we have tumor which has got high alpha beta ratio late reacting tissue which have low alpha beta ratio right now what does it mean high alpha beta ratio means that tumor will have less repair capacity which means that less repairable damage will be there after radiation late reacting tissue low alpha beta ratio which means that it will have large repair capacity and after radiation they will have more repairable damages now if you give fractionation then there will be less opportunity for repair for tumor because they have less repair capacity less repairable damage while the normal tissue means the late reacting tissue will have more opportunity for repair because they have large repair capacity and more repairable damage and this difference in repair is exploited clinically how just try to understand focus on the screen now if you look at the cell survival curve for tumor it is less curvy or small shoulder or less repair capacity this is the cell survival curve for late reacting tissue more curvy broad shoulder or large repair capacity the terminal portion remains the same right now when we give fractionated radiotherapy naturally we are in the low dose region somewhere here so let us just shrink to this curve to this dose region right and we already explained that when we give fractionated radiotherapy two things happens one the shoulder will reappear and curves get shallower and this will be true for both for tumor as well as for late effect the shoulder will reappear and the curves get shallower so when it gets shallower it means that it will be spared but both the curves are getting shallower it means that when you give fractionated radiotherapy it will spare normal tissue means late reacting tissue it will spare tumor also but if you just try to find out the degree of shallowness from single fraction then degree of shallowness is much much more for normal tissue as compared to the tumor and that is the reason that you get a therapeutic gain so we can say that fractionation will spare late reacting tissue more than tumor and because of this you get 
a therapeutic advantage and that is the reason why we treat you know why we treat tumor with fractionated radiotherapy i hope you understand now the next question is that why we use two gray per fracture in our day to day practice again i am taking uh, the normal tissue spinal cord and a tumor so this is the cell survival curve for spinal cord this is the cell survival curve for tumor right now if in in low dose region there is a differential cell kill for tumor and the spinal cord right you can see that for for tumor the reduction in survival fraction is from this point to this point while for the spinal cord it is from this point to this point so there is a differential cell killing more in tumor less in late reacting tissue right and it has been observed that this was mainly seen at 150 to 200 centigrade right so at 200 centigrade we can say that there is a gap between the two cell survival curve favoring the normal tissue sparing right now this gap is when you give a single fraction remember when you give 35 fractions of fractionated radiotherapy this gap is amplified many times so now you can see that when you give 70 gray the reduction in survival fraction for tumor is from this point to this point while for normal tissue is from this point to this point so more damage in the tumor less damage in the normal tissue and that is the reason that we deliver two gray per fraction as a conventional fractionation size now these three graph just to show you that as the gap between the two graph favoring the normal tissue sparing increases the 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 therapeutic advantage keeps increasing right so the if somebody ask you what is the most effective measure to increase the therapeutic ratio the answer is fractionation now i hope it is clear to all the students and all the participants now coming on to the day dose rate effect which we see in brachytherapy so this is again very important this again you know something which we practice daily the brachytherapy the dose rate effect now this dose rate effect is related with dose per fraction right in or dose rate effect is related with fractionation so again try to understand now this is the steepest curve when you deliver single fraction as the number of fraction increases the shoulder reappear and curves get shallower shallower and shallower why it is so <clears throat> if you deliver 40 gray in four fraction 40 gray in 10 fraction 40 gray in 20 fraction so what is the change change is that as you increase the number of fraction dose per fraction decreases and we know that two types of cell death alpha and beta alpha is predominantly seen in low dose region beta predominantly seen in high dose region so as the number of fraction increases dose per fraction decreases the contribution by alpha keeps decreasing uh, sorry increasing and contribution by beta keeps decreasing and there will be a stage when there will be no contribution by beta all the cell will be killed by alpha so if you just you know uh, uh, try to find out a relation between fractionated external beam radiotherapy and brachytherapy we can say that continuous low dose rate brachytherapy may be considered as large number of fraction with small dose per fraction it is something similar to fractionated radiotherapy sdr brachytherapy may be considered as a small number of fraction with large dose per fraction it is something related to srs or sbrt or non fractionated radiotherapy so keep these two thing in mind low dose rate fractionated radiotherapy radiotherapy as per icr u38 the then is something like this ldr mdr and sdr mdr we have never used in the world we were using ldr in the past and now we have moved to sdr so let me just briefly uh, you know discuss what is the radio biology so dose rate effect now this is the steepest curve with high dose rate brachytherapy 
as i said sdr brachytherapy is similar to non fractionated radiotherapy so the curve is steepest and we know here in high dose region the beta component is main mode of cell kill relative contribution by alpha is less very less now as the dose rate decreasing as the dose rate decreasing it is something like dose per fraction decreasing so as you get move from non fractionated rt to fractionated rt just try to imagine that similarly as you move from high dose rate to low dose rate brachytherapy what will happen the alpha cell kill increases and beta cell kill decreases right so curves get shallower shallower and shallower alpha contribution keep increasing as reflected by size of the latter and beta keeps on decreasing i hope i am clear to you now there is a stage when all the contribution by alpha and this stage is usually reached at 100 centigrade per hour so <clears throat> now let us look at the clinical application now carcinoma cervix let me take this example we started treating carcinoma cervix with radium cube and the dose rate used to be 53 centigrade per hour and total dose delivered used to be 75 gray at point a now there was a time when we moved from radium tube to you know remote controlled brachytherapy machine that is called selectron i am i i know that all the new generation have not seen selectron because they these machines have been phased out from every center now we are using sdr brachytherapy all of us but senior people might have some you know experience of working on selectron the dose rate of selectron brachytherapy was 140 to 200 centigrade though as per icru guideline this dose rate is still a low dose rate but it is more than you know 53 centigrade or 100 centigrade so if you look at the 53 centigrade and draw a cell survival curve it will be something like this here the main contribution or only contribution in cell kill will be by alpha because we have seen in previous slide that at 100 centigrade per hour all the contribution in cell kill is by alpha and naturally this 53 centigrade is less than 100 centigrade so all the contribution will be by alpha when you use 200 centigrade per hour though it is low dose rate but it is more than 100 centigrade which means that beta will also start contributing and curves get steeper so to reduce the survival fraction to the same point you have to deliver less doses with selectron brachytherapy so we can conclude that to get the same tumor control what we achieved with 75 gray with a dose rate of 53 centigrade per hour but to achieve the same tumor control if we are using 200 centigrade per hour dose rate we have to deliver less dose how much less by clinical experience we it came out to be 65 to 70 gray so this dose will be iso effective with 75 gray so you have to do a 10 to 20% reduction in total dose if you treat with selectron brachytherapy in order to get the same tumor control but now we know all of us are moving or working on hdr brachytherapy hdr brachytherapy dose rate is very high this is something like non fractionated radiotherapy naturally the curve will be very very steep and main contribution in cell kill is by beta so to get the same survival fraction you have to further reduce the dose total dose so to get the same tumor control you have to reduce the total dose further and how much again this the clinical experience the consensus is that around 30 to 40% dose reduction should be given to get the same tumor control for example if after external beam radiotherapy in carcinoma cervix we are delivering a 35 gray with low dose rate brachytherapy then with sdr brachytherapy we should deliver 21 gray and of course it has to be delivered in fractionation now the next question is 
do we need any correction factor below 100 centigrade per hour answer is no why because we have seen that 100 centigrade all the cell kill is by alpha so there is no further any scope for any further shallowness of the curve so whether it is 100 centigrade or 53 centigrade the curve will not change so to get the same survival fraction same dose will be delivered so there will not be any correction factor below 100 centigrade per hour but we need to apply a correction factor if the dose rate is more than 100 centigrade per hour so that was about the fractionation and now we can move on to the next that is oxygen how the oxygen will affect the cell survival curve now <clears throat> So Dr. Swartz in 1912, for the first time, shown that when tightly packed, tightly pressed skin is irradiated, there was less skin damages or less skin changes. And this was indirectly related with blood supply and later on related with oxygen. And then these are various landmark studies on effect of oxygen on radiation. Now, what is oxygen effect? Cells are much more sensitive to radiation in the presence of oxygen. What oxygen does? Now, in indirect action, we know that free radicals are formed, that is hydroxy radical, which damages the DNA molecule, and this damage can be repaired. Oxygen fix this damage, and the repair process is slowed down. So that is the advantage of oxygen. But oxygen should be present during irradiation or within millisecond after radiation because we know the timeline or the lifespan of free radical is very, very short, millisecond. So either oxygen should be present during radiation or within millisecond after the exposure. Now, this is a natural radiation sensitizer. So oxygen is a natural radiation sensitizer. You, you know the nat <clears throat> nature always keep a balance when nature provides a natural radiation sensitizer it also provides a natural radiation protector and that is sulfhydryl group and this sulfhydryl group basically remove the free radical from the system and protect the damage but remember that oxygen and sulfhydryl only acts on indirect action and they don't have any effect on direct action of radiation to DNA molecule. How the radiation sensitivity changes with decreasing oxygen tension? Very interesting. Now the normal pressure of oxygen is 760 millimeter of mercury and oxygen tension is 100%. And you will appreciate that there is hardly any change in oxygen or in, in radiation sensitivity with reduction in oxygen with the pressure from 760 to 20 millimeter of mercury. Hardly any change. It is almost a plateau. But after this, there is a sudden fall in the radiation sensitivity. And at 3 millimeter of mercury, it, it, it falls down to just half. And maximum radio resistance is observed at 1 upon 100 millimeter of mercury. Important point here is that most of the normal tissue remains on an oxygen pressure between 20 to 40 millimeter of mercury. And here you see there is hardly any change in radiation sensitivity. So we can say that under, under normal circumstances, normal tissues have good sensitivity to radiation. Now, what is the effect of oxygen on cell survival curve? Now, the, the cell survival curve for oxic cell is steepest, which means the oxic cells are most sensitive. Now, as the oxygen concentration decreases, the cell survival curves getting shallower, shallower, and shallower. And this is the cell survival curve for completely hypoxic cell, which means that to reduce the survival fraction to same point, you have to deliver higher dose of hypoxic, higher dose of radiation for hypoxic cell kill. And we know that the ratio of dose of radiation to get the same survival fraction in hypoxic cell to oxic cell is known as oxygen enhancement ratio. So in this figure, oxygen enhancement ratio is dH upon D0. 
So oxygen enhancement ratio may be defined as ratio of hypoxic to aerobic irradiation doses needed to achieve the same biological effect. So OER is equal to D0 hypoxic versus D0 aerobic. And for X-rays and gamma radiation, it is around 2.5 to 3. So we can say that we require at three times higher dose for hypoxic cells to reduce the survival fraction to 37%. For example, this is the oxic cell survival curve. This is the hypoxic. You reduce the survival fraction to 37%. If you deliver two gray for oxic cell, then you will have to deliver three times higher, that is six gray for hypoxic cell. Now, effect of oxygen on cell survival curve, if you see, the gap between the curve is much more in terminal portion as compared to initial portion. Or we can say that oxygen enhancement ratio is higher in terminal portion, which is seen at higher dose as compared to lower dose reason. Now the question is why it is so. Now you, all of you can answer this. High dose reason, if I ask you, what is the main mode of cell kill? You will say it is beta, right? And what is beta exactly? Beta is interaction of sublethal damage, which ultimately result to cell death. And this sublethal damage may get repaired. And what oxygen does? They will fix this sublethal damage. That is the reason that you get higher an oxygen enhancement ratio in high dose reason. In low dose reason, you know, most of the cell kill is by alpha. The contribution by beta is small. So oxygen enhancement ratio is less because very less number of sublethal damage which need to be fixed by oxygen. What are the parameters which affect the oxygen enhancement ratio? One is dose per fraction, as I have already discussed that if you in low dose reason, it is less in high dose reason, it is more. Pressure of oxygen that also I have already discussed. Type of radiation and cell cycle, if you look at the type of radiation, now for X-ray it is 2.5, for alpha particle it is just one. Why it is one? Because all the heat result into cell death. There is no sublethal damage which need to be fixed in case of alpha particle. So we can say that alpha particle radiation is as effective for hypoxic cell as for oxic cell. For neutron, there is a small shoulder or very less number of sublethal damage which need to be fixed by oxygen. So it is very, very less, 1.3. Cell cycle and OER, cell cycle as phase shows maximum oxygen enhancement ratio followed by G1, followed by G2M. In laboratory, we can find out the heterogeneous, we can find out the hypoxic fraction of any tumor if you have a radiobiology laboratory. How? Take a heterogeneous population of the cell. Survival estimates were made between 200 red to 2000 red and survival curve is plotted. Now, when you have a heterogeneous population consists of oxic and hypoxic cell, and you generate a cell survival curve, naturally the initial portion of the cell survival curve belongs to oxic cell because they are relatively more sensitive and they will be killed first. Had there not been any, 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 any hypoxic fraction, the curve would have ended like this. But there is a hypoxic fraction which is less sensitive, so curves get shallower. So this represents the cell survival curve for hypoxic component. So you extrapolate this hypoxic component back and where it meets on survival fraction will give the hypoxic fraction. Like in this example, this tumor consists of 1% hypoxic fraction. Clinical implication, we all know various experimental solid tumor in animal have shown to have hypoxic content between 10 to 40%, which limit the radio curability. However, it should be remembered that even if a minute portion of the tumor is hypoxic, it will affect your radio curability. There are abundant evidence to support the existence of hypoxic cell in human tumor as well. For example, there is an association between anemia and poor local control rate, which in some cases can be improved by pre-radiation blood transfusion. Success of some clinical trials in which hyperbaric oxygen breathing was used and success of few clinical trials of oxygen mimetic hypoxic cell sensitizer. So all these trials uh, suggest that there are hypoxic fraction 
Now this is the data from carcinoma surveys. You can see disease-free survival was better in patient having median PO2 more than 10 millimeter of mercury than patient with median PO2 less than 10 millimeter of mercury. Similarly, data from head and neck cancer, tumor control is better if patient having a small hypoxic fraction as compared to large hypoxic fraction. <clears throat> Data from prostate, the biochemical elastic survival was better when patient has less hypoxic fraction. Now, these two gentlemen, Thomilson and Gray, did a great work in making our understanding clear about the, uh, about the hypoxia. Now, they studied the histological section of bronchial carcinoma. And what they observed, that there are two types of hypoxia, the chronic hypoxia and the acute hypoxia. The chronic hypoxia is because of limited diffusion, you know, uh, diffusion capacity of oxygen from the capillary. So all the cells which are within this range are oxic, but cells which are beyond this range are hypoxic. Acute hypoxia is basically transient fluctuation in the tumor blood flow, which result into transient occlusion in the blood vessel, resulting into acute hypoxia. So chronic hypoxia is basically related with limited oxygen diffusion capacity and acute, hypo, acute hypoxia is a result of chaotic vasculature and interstitial pressure. Now in chronic hypoxia, these two gentlemen also calculated the distance up to which the oxygen can diffuse from this capillary and it is 150 to 200 micrometer. So any sheet of tumor will have three zones. One is oxic zone, another is hypoxic zone beyond the oxic zone, and third is anoxic necrotic zone. Now as a radiation oncologist, I am not worried about the oxic zone because I know radiation will take care of. As an oncologist, I am not worried about the necrotic zone because I know the cells are not viable in necrotic zone. But as a radiation oncologist, I am worried about hypoxic zone because I know that in hypoxic zone, the oxygen concentration is enough to keep them alive, but less to keep them protected from, from radiation. They further stated, these two gentlemen, that no tumor caught with an average radius of less than 116 micron short tumor necrosis because that is the distance up to which the oxygen can diffuse. No tumor cord with a radius of more than 200 micron was without necrotic center because that is the maximum distance up to which oxygen can diffuse from a capillary. As tumor size increases, the thickness of viable tumor sheath remains safe. That is 100 to 180 micron because that is the distance up to which the oxygen can diffuse. Acute hypoxia, as I said, the uh, the vasculature is abnormal, evident, the base membrane is absent, the vessels are dilated, tortuous, elongated with avicent, etc., etc., and this result into an in, increase in intratumoral pressure. Now, this table shows the hypoxic fraction of some tumor. The important point here is that some of the tumors show very high percentage of hypoxic cells, and that may be one of the reasons that they are radio resistant. Now let me just show you one experiment. You have a tumor which consists of hypoxic cells as well as oxic cells. Suppose hypoxic component is 14%. You treat from Monday to Thursday and after 24 hours on Friday, you again calculate the hypoxic fraction. The tumor has reduced in size, but when you calculate the hypoxic fraction, it remains the same, that is 14 fraction. But if you look at the absolute number, suppose initially it consists of 100 cells, 14 are hypoxic. After radiation, 50 cells are surviving, but hypoxic component percentage is same, but absolute number, it is half, seven. Here it was 14. So what happened to rest of the seven cell during fractionation? We all know that these cells move from hypoxic compartment to oxic compartment, and this process is known as reoxygenation. So, in reoxygenation, what happens in clinical setting that when you start radiation, oxic cells are killed so that only hypoxic fractions survive. But by the time next day you 
put you you deliver another fraction of radiation some of the cells from oxy compartment move to the oxy compartment and become radio sensitive and they will be killed during next fraction and again you will have hypoxic fraction so same process will be repeated every day and that is how we overcome the problem of hypoxia if you look at the time sequence now this is an animal experiment initially if there is a 20% hypoxic component and at this point if you deliver very high dose of radiation it will kill all the oxic cells so you will have 100% only hypoxic cells but very soon the concept percentage get down back to the pre rt level that is 20% like in this experiment after 6 hour it gets back to 20% because of reoxygenation or movement of some of the cells from hypoxic compartment to the oxy compartment time time sequence of reoxygenation vary from one type of tumor to other some are rapidly oxygenated after rt while others takes few days the only experimental tumor that does not show significant reoxygenation is osteosarcoma and that may be one of the reason that it is radio resistant now mechanism of reoxygenation there are various mechanism one just try to understand very simple mechanism now for example if there are, first is the reduction in ratio of tum total tumor cells to the surface area of blood vessel for example if 10 capillaries are supplying to 100 tumor cells after first fractions 20 cells are killed so now 10 capillaries are supplying to 80 while they can supply to 100 so 20 cells from the hypoxic compartment will be recruited back to oxy compartment second when you deliver radiation the oxic cells will be killed and they will be removed from the system so that the whole this system will move nearer to the capillaries and these hypoxic cells will start getting oxygen third when you deliver radiation then what happens that these cells are dead so when these cells are dead they will no more consume oxygen so before radiation if oxygen is diffused up to this distance but now these cells will not consume any oxygen so oxygen diffusing distance will now increase and they will also go up to hypoxic cell and finally when cells are killed you know some 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 vessels which are obliterated because of in increased intratumoral pressure when cells are killed this intratumoral pressure get reduced as a result these occluded blood vessels also opens up and start supplying oxygen and one important somebody asked question during first day that how anti angiogenic you know uh, 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 is 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 added with radiation what how it it affects the radiation so anti angiogenic also uh, you know work through the same process it will reduce the intratumoral pressure because we know that vessels are very leaky because they are abnormal so because of leaky vessels you, the, the 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 fluids are leaked in the interstitial space when you use anti angiogenic therapy like bevacizumab it organize the vessels it try to repair the leakiness and as this result into reduction of intratumoral pressure and this ultimately help in opening the already occluded vessels and they again start providing oxygen to the tumor cell all right so i have covered i think fractionation and oxygen i think it is already 7:30 so i must stop at this point and rest of the thing i will cover uh, in my last days that is tomorrow so we can stop at this point dr deepa and uh, i can now have some questions if there is any Yes, sir. Thank you. There are some questions in uh, head and neck. Uh, uh, when we are discussing head and neck, like there was a question: mm -hmm. Why pure acceleration, that is six fractions per week schedule, is not popular or not being clinically practiced? Okay. So, so, so basically, let me tell you first the you know the the lobbying. Now, what what we mean by lobbying? Uh, see, uh, the the fractionation schedule was evolved in Western countries, and they only work 5 days a week they don't work on saturday right so that is how five fractions per week is evolved though radio biologically you see there is no rationale why we should not give six fraction 
second of course logistical issue logistical issue is that you know since we have adopted the same five fractions per week now it is very difficult for technicians to ask them to work on the sixth day right so that is another reason but let me tell you that uh, in my uh, you know clinical practice i have practiced six fractions per week very frequently and i have published two three papers on this issue only and i did not find any problem except yes except that acute toxicity is increased so you have to manage acute toxicity if you are able to manage acute toxicity especially the intake proper intake during radiation and i my personal experience is that when i put a rice tube the acceptance or tolerance of six fraction per day improved largely so intake is very important Thank you, sir. Uh, another question is like a uh, uh, comment of local control uh, rate between the two different fractionation fractionation in head and neck region. Can you can you repeat? I didn't uh, get the first part of your. <coughs> it is the local control rate between two different fractionation. That is sixty six in thirty fraction or seventy grain thirty five fractions along with chemotherapy in head and neck cancers. See, I can't give you figure. Basically, if there is any radio biological question, just ask me. If you give sixty six in thirty, right? So, 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 uh, you can you can refer to these yeah. articles which are using you know these. So you can find out the control rate from there. I can't. I don't remember. I can't tell you right. Okay. <clears throat> Sir, in uh, breast there is like a will uh, hyperfractionation also result in higher late toxicity because both have the low alpha beta. And why in uh, uh, this start B trial there was no uh, higher uh, late toxicity? Late toxicity. Can you refer to some uh, specific late toxicity? Of course, heart and like lung. Sub heart, subcutaneous heart. fibrosis. Subcutaneous fibrosis. I mean, breast changes. Uh, like uh, so, so is it based on the repair capacity or? So, so if you if if you see if 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 you if you if you see the 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 cosmesis basically cosmesis was better in hyperfractionated arm, right? because because as i shown as i showed that if you calculate the the biological effective dose right it was higher in conventional fractionation arm right so that is uh, while it was lower in 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 hyperfractionated arm so naturally everything is a you know matter or a question of how much biological effective dose you are delivering it is not the physical dose it is not the you know fractionation but if you calculate the biological effective dose which already taken into account the number of fraction the total dose the dose per fraction alpha beta ratio everything has been taken into account so if you calculate the bd and you find that one schedule the bd for late effect is less naturally you will not get higher late effects um so in uh, brain there is one question like what is the radiobiology for srs or uh, srt in arteriovenous malformation <clears throat> so 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 again you you see you, you see the the you can uh, you can deliver same very high dose of radiation very high dose of radiation which causes more damage and in, in fact the av malformation you know the mechanism of action there is a endothelial damage vascular coagulation and you know blocking of the vessels basically so same same you deliver very high dose of radiation to the target and less dose of radiation to the surrounding brain okay. uh, and sir there is one in uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, oxygenation uh, is there a role for uh, spo2 monitoring when patient is on radiotherapy like spo2 monitor monitoring basically gives you an idea about the oxygen concentration in the body right and as i said that uh, you know uh, you, uh, patient having hypoxic tumor the if you monitor the spo2 it is not going to be less it is not going to be less so if you if you want to you know measure the spo2 you have to measure the spo2 of the tumor or the pressure of the oxygen from the tumor directly 
Yes, sir. Uh, there is another question. Like, uh, I think it was partially explained. Like, why LQ model pays on more than ten grados? So again, I would like to, you know, uh, give you this important message. It looks like it fails, right? It looks like it fails. But let me tell you that, you know, more and more data are pouring in, more and more experience are pouring in, which suggest that we can use LQ model is still the best model, even in, hypo, in this extreme hyperfractionation, where we are using SRS and SBRT. Linear quadratic model is still the best model to, to predict the outcome in terms of tumor control or in terms of toxicity. And still in a clinical practice, linear quadratic model is only being used during SRS or SBRT, no other model. Lot of model have been put forward, which may explain better during SRS and SBRT. They may explain better, but the problem is that they have utilized or they used so many variables in their model. And so many variables, we don't have value of those variables. While in linear quadratic model, there is only two variables, alpha and beta. And we have the value of alpha and beta. And that is the reason that LQ model is the only model which are being used in our clinical practice, whether we use fractionated radiotherapy or non-fractionated radiotherapy. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, one another question is like, uh, can altered fractionation be uh, advised in case of re-irradiation for better outcome? So again, you, again, you can use, you can use, but only only thing is what benefit you expect. What benefit you expect? Only thing is what benefit you expect. Uh, where you are you using uh, the, you want to reduce the late toxicity, yes. But only thing is that the gap between the two fraction should be, you know, more than at least 12 hours. If you want to spare the late reacting tissue. If you are giving six hours, I don't think, uh, you know, you will spare the late reacting tissue. Uh, another question is there like, uh, uh, explain, uh, can you please explain the use of high dose per fraction for palliation in bone mets? What is the mechanism? So same basically, you know, you are, you are delivering higher biological effective dose. You are delivering higher biological effective dose when you use hyperfractionation, causing more damage to the cells, tumor cells. Um, other questions are very similar to uh, what we have already explained. Okay, so, so we can stop, uh, I think, at this point of time. And once again, thanks to all the participants from uh, our country, from abroad. Thanks for joining this webinar and uh, Tomorrow we will have the last day of the of the of the course. I hope to see, see you all on the last day. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of important things which still need to be discussed, especially the tumor control probability, which has got so many implications in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So I will such request all of you to be here by 5:30 sharp. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Have a good night. Thank you, sir.
Pavna, I think we can end the meeting. Yes, ma'am. We will end it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Good night.